Hello, TW Dears. Welcome back to a new episode of The Woke Daisy. I'm Annika. And I'm Nahal. And today we get to do an interview that makes our little bookworm heart so happy. My favorite books are Silent Patient, The Henna Artist, Where the Crawdads Sing. I love thriller books. Surprise, because murders, death, and crime junkie podcasts. You know me. But Annika is obviously a writer and reader too. And something we always talk about is how important it is, especially for kids and teens, to see themselves in books and feel like they are the heroes in the stories. And that's why today's episode is so special, because it's the person that gave us the feeling with her books. The Nuja Desai EDA is an award-winning author, singer, songwriter, and innovator of the book track. Her pioneering novel, Born Confused, and heroine of both of her novels, Dimple Lella, recently turned 15. The first ever South Asian American coming-of-age young adult novel, Born Confused, was named an American Library Association Best Book for Young Adults, and it actually became a landmark work. Originally released in 2002, the novel was recently hailed by Rolling Stone Magazine, Entertainment Weekly, and Pace Magazine as one of the greatest young adult novels of all time. The hashtag BornConfuse15 was launched in celebration of its 15th anniversary, which it included in part a Brown Girl magazine series of essays by 10 authors on how protagonist Dimple Lala opened doors for their own writing path. And on a personal note, I can definitely say that Born Confused opened the door on mine too. When we were twins, this IEDA's album of original songs based on Born Confused was featured on Wired magazine for being the first ever book track. The Nuja released Bombay Blues, the sequel, but also a standalone, in 2014. Bombay Spleen, the accompanying soundtrack to Bombay Blues, is 12 tracks of infectious electro dream pop wreckage rock. The music video for the Bombay Spleen track, Ode to Bombay, Heptanesia, was actually on rotation on MTV Indies and was a closing night selection in the DC South Asian Film Festival in 2018. And the music on it was selected for a number of films and campaigns. Bombay Blues, and the new edition of Born Confused, and Bombay Spleen, the book track, launched in the U.S. in August of 2014 with the Nuja's appearance at the National Book Festival. Guys, this was co-chaired by President and First Lady Obama in Washington, D.C. And then they were all released in India in January 2015 with the Nuja's appearance on both the book and musical stages at the ZJ Poor Literature Festival. The Nuja wrote and directed the award-winning short film, The Test, and was a finalist for the Asian Women of Achievement Awards for the United Kingdom, as well as voted one of the world's 50 coolest Thaisies by ThaisyClub.com. She's been selected as a culture shop, cultural and artistic influencer, and is part of the Pink Lady Resist campaign, as well as a leading face for Thrivani Sari's Dare to Drape campaign. Soon after Born Confused launched, Time Out New York brought her on board as a guest consulting editor for their groundbreaking issue, Time Out New York, South Asian New York Special. The Nuja's books and music have been included in university, graduate school, and high school curriculums worldwide. She has guest taught and lectured worldwide as well. She was recently included in Brown Girl Magazine's Top 10 Roundup of South Asian Women for International Women's Day 2020 for writing about the immigrant experience and coming of age as a South Asian woman and creating a role model when there wasn't one. Along with Mindy Kaling, Rupi Kaur, Jamila Jamil, Lily Singh, Madam Gandhi, Deepika Mutyala, and Kavitha Krishnan, as well as key historical figures like Noor Inayat Khan and suffragette Sophia Duleep Singh. The Nuja serves on the board of directors of The Telling Room, whose mission is to empower youth, including immigrants and refugees, through writing and sharing their voices with the world. She's currently working on her next novel and her album. So welcome, The Nuja. I am super excited to to be on here with you and thank you for the work you're doing and thank you for amplifying our voices and including me. 
So and I speak on behalf of Dimple Lala as well, who's spazzing out herself. <laughs> oh, goodness. I, that's just the best fangirl moment ever. But, you know, it honestly did start so much of this. So, so much of South Asian representation did start with you. And your works have been rooted in and acclaimed for their influence both on and by South Asian culture. So you were raised in Massachusetts, from what I read, and kind of stopped. So what was your upbringing like with regard to those roots for you? So I, I was raised in, I was born in Boston, then we moved back to Bombay for a couple of years. And then I grew up from two to 17 years old in Wilbraham, Massachusetts, which is the home of Friendly's ice cream for those who, who know about oh, this ice cream. Yes. My childhood, my childhood favorite. <laughs> so that, that's the town's claim to fame. Um, my family, my parents were the first on both sides of the family to immigrate to the States after a semi-scandalous out of caste love marriage. They met in medical school in Bombay and, and fell in love and they were the first to kind of take that leap. And I'm the first American born in the family. My brother was born in Bombay. We're all American. Um, my, they naturalized uh, after coming to the States. And in our town, we were really the first of our kind of brown in our town. So essentially, um, there was nobody who looked like us at that time on the TV screen, in magazines, um, you know, at the movies, um, on the street, and certainly not on our on my childhood bookshelf. And I think a reason that I wrote Dimple Lala all those years later, uh, a lot of that drive towards that was to fill that hold, hole on my childhood bookshelf with uh, character and characters who, you know, heroes who more closely resembled the heroes in my own home. And then um, the, the South Asian community that was so inspiring that I um, fell into in New York many years later. So that said, um, I had a very daydreaming childhood. I don't think I was thinking consciously about race as I was growing up. I was basically, I, I lived in the Wilbraham Public Library. Shout out to the Wilbraham Public Library, WPL. Um, I was like part of the Scholastic Book Club, the Arrow Book Club. I was super excited whenever the bookmobile came to our school. Um, oh, Nancy Drew Book Club as, as well, where I got two Nancy Drew mysteries in one hardcover. Like every couple of months, you would flip the book over and have the second book from behind, if you know what I mean. And um, I read, read, read all the time, constantly like pacing the curb and, and walking through the woods and just kind of making up stories in my head. And, and essentially, as soon as I started reading, I started writing and, you know, I was writing sort of poems. I, I kind of invented bands and songs for them to sing and made little index cards with drawings of the singers and all. But what's interesting and something I didn't realize until writing Dimple Lala all those years later is every character I had in any story, any poem, any drawing, any invented band, they were all white, always all white. So I only realized later that not only were there not people who looked like us on TV and on our bookshelf and on the street, they weren't even in my imagination. And it's interesting to not have realized that till later, but I guess that's, that really gives you some insight into what a difference it can make to feel seen in the world around you and in you know, pop culture, mainstream media, you know, all, all of those sorts of elements that go into shaping what you see as a viable identity and who, you know, who deserves to take up space in a story. I mean, think about the first time we got our first Indian or Desi Barbie doll. We didn't even know that was a thing. We got, I remember getting one uh, Barbie doll that was wearing like a sari, a kagra with the skin color I had. And I was like, whoa, what is this? I'm not used to it. So if you're right. I feel like a lot of times when people think about representation, and I know more so this conversation with Anika that I always have, we only think about film and movies. We never think about the literary world or books. Say it's, it's been interesting to see now. Um, I have a 15 year old daughter and an 11 year old daughter, and their bookshelves are just, you know, completely to die for. And of course, I'm sure that we know a lot of the same writers in common who are on those bookshelves, like Sonali Dev and Marina Budos and Uma Krishnaswamy, and, you know, and that's, that's amazing to see. And they're mixed race. Um, their father, my husband, is French from the west of France. And up until um, just recently, they had grown up entirely in London in a very kind of mixed race, diverse, multicultural, um, you know, kind of, kind of those kind of circles. 
and this is their first time living over here and not being in a place where everybody kind of looks like them or or everyone looks different enough that we all look the same if you know what i mean but i think that they've they've had so much of that experience they have it in their personal life they've and they've grown up reading these stories and it's interesting just to see what is just a given for you know their generation growing up it's interesting that you mentioned that because i think when we look at our childhoods or the way that you know we became writers because we lacked writing that had us in it. And so it's interesting now, I'm sure for you too, as a mom and as a woman to see these two kids who are growing up in a world where they're kind of more seen than we were. And I have to ask you as a mom, do you see more confidence in them and their identity than we had? Or is that you think gonna be a perpetual problem for teenagers where they're kind of sorting it out, but maybe their issues are different? Well, I think, yeah in terms of identity that way so far so good like they feel they seem quite at ease with who they are in terms of like cultural background and all of that coming of age i think that's something that we never stop doing so i'm you know that's always going to be a process but i th- i don't think they def- define it so clearly in the terms that I ended up defining, you know, my whole kind of dilemma, which I recognized later in life, not when I was actually experiencing it so much was, you know, am I Indian enough? I'm not quite Indian enough. I'm not quite American enough. When I'm in India, I'm too American. When I'm in America, I'm too Indian. Like, where do I fit in? What do I do with this hyphenated identity? And I think for them, they don't see any of this as being like hyphenated identity. This is just who they are and the world. they're in. And yeah, which is, it's quite inspiring to, to see that. So I'm sure there will be new questions and and different sorts of, you know, issues to deal with and questions to be raised and all that. I just think that the the vocabulary with which it's defined for them is is going to be quite different than it was for me or maybe for for all of us growing up. Your infamous book, Born Confused, has a lot of influence from New York. And now, you know, everything that you've been talking about New York and stuff, I really want to know what are some of your most memorable moments that have happened in New York? And what are some experiences that you've taken that have happened to you maybe and incorporated it into Born Confused? Oh, gosh, New York. (laughs) You're like, let me think about all the time. (laughs) New York, New York. This is actually the first year um, since I, you know, moved there in 1990 that I haven't been able to go back there. Like I always, New York for me, I feel like no matter where I am, I always need a a dose of that vitamin, you know, and obviously it's a small complaint to have with everything that's, that's going on now, but it's, it's, it's like always, always home and there's always a kind of longing for it. Um, So I, when I went to New York, I, I had all kinds of different jobs Um, the plan was I wanted to write a book and, you know, I was going to do that at night. And during the day I waitressed, I hostessed at a Tex-Mex restaurant. I was a dog walker for a little while, a secretary at the Whitney Museum and an intern at the Paris Review. Um, the last few years I was there, I was mostly doing editing and copy editing at various magazines and custom publishing places. Um, and it was just, uh, you know, I did write some short stories there, but, it was so hard to stay in and like sort of sit down and (laughs) face the blank screen and all. But I did something that helped me do that was I took a writing workshop at the writer's voice, the YMCA with a wonderful teacher, Kaylee Jones. And I was writing a a bunch of different short stories in this workshop. And um, at a certain point in time, like we broke off into kind of a novel writing or collection writing group. And I was kind of stuck with these stories and there was one incredible workshop meeting where we got together. It was a pretty small group, maybe six or eight of us at that point. And uh, a couple of people commented on my main character of, I think it was Amy from Minneapolis. And, and they said, you know, why don't you, you know, this character seems clearly to be, this was a white character that I'd written as usual. And, uh, and then somebody in the class said, it, it's so clear that this character has a different perspective though when she enters the room and sees this unlike this person, et cetera. And then another person said, why don't you just make her Indian and see what happens? And it had never occurred to me And, you know, these, there were never people of color in any writing workshops I took either. Um, But, you know, props to these people for saying that. And I thought, like, how can I possibly do that? And literally, I, I went home and I opened up these documents and 
I mostly did like a find and replace. I turned Amy into Kayla, made her, you know, a New England raised person like me. And um, with very few other changes, all of a sudden these stories suddenly hung together more like a collection of short stories with that change. And that happened at this workshop and the hostessing, waitressing job at the Tex-Mex restaurant is how I met another waitress who told me about the workshop. And that, that was a, a key breakthrough moment, even though it wasn't until, you know, years later, I, I kind of knew how to take that character further, or explore those themes further. A huge thing that happened in New York is, of course, in the late 90s, there was a whole blossoming, burgeoning South Asian second generation diaspora you know, music scene and club scene. And, and it was an incredible, incredible moment for the diaspora. The year like 1997 specifically is when DJ Reka started her basement Bhangra party, um, the South Asian Journalists Association, the South Asian Women's Creative Collective, all these different sorts of um, communities organized and, and formed and began to kind of link up. And it was when I became part of that moment and those communities that I started to see a, a window into the culture that wasn't purely based just on family history, but was also, you know, part of my own daily, like modern day life in New York City, and um, and that that scene um, kind of was the the missing link that I needed to be able to tell the story that I wanted to tell, and that all inspired, you know, the club scene and Born Confused and Hot Pot and all of those elements. So that was I was thinking. thinking that while you were speaking because I just kept thinking, how many times have I read this book and exactly how many times have I pictured all of these things happening in New York? And that's, you know, within five to 10 years of me graduating high school. So I, as I read this in my white little t college town, I kept thinking, oh my gosh, this is why you moved to New York. There are brown people there. <laughs> and there's all these experiences. There's lectures. People are talking about this. And as silly as it sounds, the first time I ever heard of cultural appropriation. And the first time I read, even in a YA version of this dialogue about the diaspora, the first time I read that was in your book. And I thought, oh my gosh, that's actually appropriation. And that's exactly where I learned about all of this. And I think it's hysterical to me now that, you know, 10, 20 years down the line, we're running a podcast that often talks about appropriation and that we're talking about basic things. I find it really funny sometimes that I'm the one who's sitting here doing this. But your book was incredibly pivotal in shaping that and also putting names to things that we all felt as Daisy girls growing up, sitting here and seeing our white friends take on a lot of our histories without all of the consequences and the baggage that came with it. Or, you know, reading, for example, about Gwen, I remember thinking, oh, but everybody always does to do such cool things with our stuff. But whenever I do it, I look so lame and like, you know, and just, you know, having these really relatable moments, but also having names attached to them and really kind of adding a smidge of academia to it in a way that made us really recognize uh, that these dialogues were happening, that these, this movement was happening in other places um, was incredibly powerful. So it was very cool to have an experience of New York through your eyes, through the book for somebody who was in central Pennsylvania. So that was pretty awesome. But, you know, I, I know you mentioned also that your, your husband is French and that you've lived in London as well, I saw in your bio. So what took you to those places? You've definitely been, had a global experience in, in many ways, which is so cool. Uh, so much of that global experience also happened in New York and happened right here in my, you know, country of my birth. Um, and so London, so London, we went to, it was through my husband's work. So he wasn't yet my husband. We had met in, in New York the last couple of years that I lived there. And um, it was through his work. And he asked me if I, if I was open to it or wanted to leave. And I, I, at that point, you know, the first year I lived in New York, I couldn't stand New York. And I actually, I left New York after a year. And then I came back after that one year away. And I thought I will just never leave this place. I, I was just so kind of, and you know, still am so enamored of the city, just kind of, you know, inhaling it and just, you know, really kind of sinking into that whole experience. Um, but then when this opportunity came up to, you know, move to London and it was going to, the timing was such that it was going to be about um, two or three weeks after we were getting married. We thought, how can we not go do that? Like go have an adventure in a city neither of us had lived in too. So it felt like a kind of neat thing to do together to go discover this place together as well as we started our, our life together. So that's what took us to London. And London, I think if we hadn't gone, I, I don't know that I would have been able to 
write Born Confused or Bombay Blues because in New York, New York was just really like, you know, you step out of your, the door of your apartment building and you're swept up down those long <laughs> yeah. avenues. The, the, layout, the layout of the city is like that too. It's like just these long avenues, you know, in the village it winds and twists and all, but it's just kind of like you're just swept up into this current and there's so much uh, stimuli. And um, I think that there was so much stimuli, but I never kind of found the space or the self-discipline maybe to process it. I was too close to all of it and too like in all of it. And London actually affords you all the same stimuli, but I feel like th there was more of a choice in terms of, you know, whether I was going to be swept up or I was going to take it slower. And I think some of that is in the layout of London as well. It's, it's enormous. There are all these crescents and curves and winding streets and, you know, like little hidden, hidden nooks. Even after 17 years of living there, we were constantly discovering new places in London, like new little pockets and gardens and things like that. And um, from London, I was able to really kind of look back on that time, those years in New York, and especially those last few years in that South Asian scene, and look, look back even on my years growing up in Western Massachusetts and start to see the shape of the story there. And with Bombay Blues, the sequel to Born Confused, London ended up being a great point from which to actually go to India, you know, in half the time. And so much diaspora culture is in the UK as well. So there's a lot of London, in Born Confused, for example, Dimple grows up on uh, Lancaster Road and that was the street, you know, just, I, we lived on Portobello Road when I wrote Born Confused and the next sort of cross street up was Lancaster Road. And then the temple scene in New Jersey, I researched by going to a temple in um, Neesden in the UK. So there are various things like various, you know, nods to, to um to london in that book and it's it feels like it's very much embedded in that new jersey story that's so cool i didn't know that obviously but it's incredible that all of these different global experiences have sort of wound together and kind of created this incredible narrative and incredible story that touches people on so many different levels as well there's layers to everything that you've done which i find totally magical because you get so many little secrets and you get so many little pockets of exploration to kind of navigate through and to figure out. And, and that's very, very cool, just both as a reader, as a writer, and also just as a creative to be able to see that is really fascinating. Like your process is, is sounds really interesting to be able to, to weave them all together. Your writing career isn't a singular path of creativity. You're an award-winning musician and a video filmmaker. For listeners, the Nuja's accomplishments go far beyond the bio I gave you at the beginning of this episode. Her Deep Blue She, Mutiny to Utiny, Me Too music video remix PSA featured about 100 artists and activists, mostly women of color and also mostly Vasey, and they received the Gold Lion Award at the 2018 London Film Awards. They were an official closing night selection at the South Asian Film Festival of Washington, D.C., and they were featured on the BBC, SOAS Radio, and Madame Gandhi's The Futurist Female Spotify playlist. So Tanuja, you were shortlisted for the Asian Women of Achievement Award in UK and regularly appear on Brown Girl Magazine roundups and list. So what prompted you to think a creative career is for me and how did you get your foot in the door? I think so. Um, as far back as I can remember, I always wanted to, to write and I was always interested in, in music and kind of intertwining those two things. Um, there's a, a wonderful musician who was a dear friend to Sam Zaman, state of Bengal, and he once said, music is the only language I know. And I think there's something to that as well. Like, I feel like those were, that's writing and words and language. That's just how I, I process everything. I mean, I suppose all of us do to some extent, but like everything, everything, you know, like I kind of, I often found in my interactions with, you know, friends or different people, if I, if I wrote something down rather than said it, I could go completely to a different space than by having a conversation. Um, so I think that, that those felt like they were my natural elements, but also I think I'm like pretty bad at everything else. <laughs> it's kind of, there's, I kind of have to do that because I don't know what else I would possibly do. I was a terrible waitress and hostess. Like I, was renowned for leading, you know, groups of eight people into the Blue Moon, this Tex-Mex restaurant, when there was not a seat to be found, and then just kind of walking them in circles, just trying to, like, then make them exit the restaurant. I ruined, you know, deliveries of faxes when I was at the Whitney Museum. Like, I accidentally faxed 
you know, the copy I had handwritten my edits on to like some very important recipient. And then I couldn't really pull it out of the fax machine once the fax monster started going. I have all kinds of stories like this. So I mean, <laughs> it's funny. It's funny because our generation thinks that we are these like side hustlers because we work full time jobs. And, you know, we also have all the things we're passionate about, whether it be writing or podcasting. But you were the OG side hustles with you know, doing all these jobs like waitressing and like doing odd jobs or things that could do like a couple of hours just so you could get your foot in the door. So I respect you a lot for that. Oh my God, thank you. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm sure my former bosses may not feel the same way. Oh, I also, when I was dog walking, I was, I was, dog, I was dog walker in part for this um, Saluki, which is a very, very fast, like ancient Egyptian breed of dog. And I remember I was, I don't know, like in my early 20s in New York, it was a beautiful day and I took the Saluki to Central Park and I thought, you know, this is amazing. Like we are free to be whoever we want to be and to express ourselves, the sky is the limit. And you know, Cleopatra was the dog's name. Cleo should also feel free on a beautiful day like this and we'll walk together unbound by the chains of oppression, whatever I was thinking in my head that time. And I un undid the leash and she was like gone. She was just like a shooting star off in the distance. And then I just spent my entire kind of lunch break, I was walking her actually for someone I was doing another job for, just trying to run through Central Park. I was also wearing heels at the time. I was wearing candies because I got them free from a giveaway desk at a place where I had done an editing job. <laughs> and so that was, a, that was like a typical day at work. So between all of the things that are happening in your life during this time, how did you even create these characters in your book? You have these infamous characters like Dimple, Karsh, and Gwen. How did they come to be? I know you mentioned how you came up with Amy at this retreat, but I want to know if there's a different story with these three. Oh, none of, none of that was happening while I was doing all of this stuff. So like I was doing the short stories where Amy, you know, white Amy, from, <laughs> yeah. you know, from Minneapolis. <laughs> with some kind, well, I've never been to Minneapolis, so I don't even know how to take that. Um, so, so the book didn't happen then, but the book happened after we moved to London. And I started working on it almost immediately after getting to London. Although I realized that I think for years I was trying to write the story of Dimple and to some extent the story of Dimple and Gwyn. Like there was this short story that I worked on maybe 10 different times, more than 10 drafts, but at 10 different moments in time during these creative writing workshops in New York. It was called Melt, and I just could never finish it. And I wrote different versions of it. I kept coming back to it, and it would just like keep spiraling off in a million directions. It wasn't containable, containable as a short story, and it, it just never, you know, found closure. And I realized later as well, like those, the characters were actually probably Dimple and Gwyn when they were little and they first meet in the in the neighborhood that they live in in Springfield, New Jersey. And eventually that was a seed to Born Confused, even though that flashback is only maybe a paragraph in the book. But that story I worked on for years. Then um, the short film, uh, The Test, there's an Indian American protagonist in that who's trying to get the result of a pregnancy test while, you know, she comes home thinking she's going to be alone and do that. And her mother's organized a suitable boy meeting. And it's kind of a 10 minute film that's taking place with all these things happening at once. And even though there's no pregnancy test as of yet in Dimple's story, I think she was also kind of a precursor to Dimple. And then um, at another point in New York, I did a, a screenplay writing class and I wrote this pretty terrible script that I called the Madonna complex. And there's a, definite dimple character with a best friend who's a definite like precursor to Gwyn in that. So I think all of those things were part of my path to getting to the book. Um, and then the, the first book came, uh, you know, the writing of it didn't take that long in the sense that it took me four months to do the first draft and then five months to, um, to revise it. However, it probably took me my entire life up until that point to write it. So, you know, it was either very fast or like epically long, and it was probably epically long. And um, the characters of Gwyn and Dimple and Kirsch, so Dimple, even though the plot line is fictitious, uh, other than the backstory of the parents is based completely on my parents' backstory of, you know, meeting in Bombay, having a love marriage, all of that. Feeding each other led dudes on a bench. Yes, uh, that's, all, that's all fact. Um, other than that, the plot line is fictitious, but uh, there's a lot of me and Dimple um, the town that she grows up in is based on Wilbraham, Massachusetts. The layout of the streets is the layout of the streets that I grew up on. 
the high school is my high school. Mirror Lake is Bennett Pond that was, you know, kind of behind our neighborhood. Um, so that's, that's all in there. Um, Kirsch, the name Kirsch is, um, I first heard the name, the only time I've ever heard the name is Kirsch Kale, the musician, tabla player, multi so I met him as well in those years in, in New York, like with DJ Reka and that whole late 90s moment. And the name really stuck in my head because I had never heard it before. And that moment as well was when, you know, when the test screened in, in um, some of these festivals almost overnight, I suddenly met the whole, this kind of Desi community in New York. I had never had a Desi crowd or circle before that. And almost overnight, I suddenly met all these musicians and actors and screenplay writers and people, you know, with my cultural b background to some extent or entirely, um, who were, you know, working or working towards working in the arts. And that's also, you know, when uh, the music scene at Basement Bhangra was taking off and the Asian underground music scene in the UK. And that was fascinating to also just see all these musicians and all these I started thinking of this idea of like a suitable boy who's suitable precisely because he's unsuitable or like, you know, for Dimple. And so some of it came from there. And then Gwyn is, you know, she's imagined, she's kind of an amalgam of many Gwyns I've had in my life. And a definite spark for her was um, Gwen Stefani, no doubt, like Tragic Kingdom era, <laughs> era you know, she with the bindi and all of that, everything that was going on at that, at that time. So I think all of those things sort of combined um, together to inform this story. One of the things that to this day stands out, because I remember talking about it with my cousins who were reading the book at the same time, is that you not only had an LGBTQ couple, which was pretty ahead of the times for the literary world. Publishing is still kind of, I feel like they're just now kind of catching up to it and recognizing the value of having real own voices stories, right? So you had an LGBTQ couple and somebody who was transgender, which was amazing because that character is one of the most beautiful I've ever read. And society was definitely not quite that open back then. It was something that I remember reading and didn't read for another 10 years. You know, it was something that it was so, so unique to that story. and. What prompted the inclusion? And did you face pushback with your editors? Because I would be really curious as a writer how that entire process played out because there, weren't a whole, there wasn't a whole lot of representation as is. You were already breaking like, boundaries just trying to get an Indian character, I think, you know, as a, as a main character. You were the first South Asian young adult uh, story that was kind of out there. So what was the story here? How did that work? I, well, that was just, you know, reflective of the world that we're in and that I was in at the time. And whether society is open or not, this is, this is the truth. And, you know, these humans and these connections, all of it matters, all of it's valid, all of it counts. Trans women are women. I didn't know that language then for Zara, because that was almost, you know, 20 years ago. Um, but that's the truth. Love is love. And this was, uh, this was the world I was drawing from. And again, not the actual plot lines, but that same moment in late 90s New York, when South Asian culture was really, you know, the diaspora culture was really coming of age and all, um, it was all very intertwined. So, so at these parties and at these debates and at these various events, you know, the LGBTQ community was very much intertwined and, and very much a part of the coming of age of the whole culture and our collective exploration of identity as that community very well should be. And, you know, there was um, Salga, there was the South Asian Lesbian and Gay Alliance that formed around that time. Um, they had a float in the um, India Day Parade. I think that was 98, maybe I was at the parade and, and saw that. And it was just all, it was all uh, beautifully kind of woven tapestry. I'm not saying it was, you know, obviously it was difficult for various individuals and, you know, people had their own journey towards coming out. But as far as, you know, what I, I saw happening in that moment, it was, um, it was a really beautiful thing because I think we were seeing an incredibly diverse group of people within the subculture and seeing that, you know, there is no one way to be South Asian or to be Indian or to be Pakistani. There's no one way to be a woman or there's no one way to be anything. There's infinite ways to be human. And this whole um, idea of hyphenated identity, I think that everybody is of a hyphenated identity. If you go, if you go back far enough or just also simply 
by being human beings who are constantly trying to bring into balance different drives and desires and, you know, duty and desire and all, all these different kinds of emotions and experiences that we have. And, and a, a big thing that I kind of um, uh, learned from Dimple or th through the process have been learning through um, writing these characters is that a hyphen doesn't have to be a border. It can also be a bridge. And we don't have to be 50% either side of our hyphen. We can be 100%, we can be 200%. We can mix up the hyphen, we can live on the hyphen, um, you know, and, and I think that this, it, it was natural that, that the queer community and LGBTQ community and trans community would be part of that as well. And part of this idea of, you know, all of us inhabiting the in-between and it might be in terms of, of, you know, culture, it might be in terms of country, it might be in terms of gender, sexuality, whatever it might be. There's a, a very rich space that's, that, that lives in between things and in between the boxes and the definitions. Um, as far as pushback, um, no, like my editor, he was amazing, Scholastic was amazing. They bought the book before I wrote it based on a proposal. And that whole story is magical in an, in and of itself. That's another New York anecdote if we have time for it later. Um, but um, no, he, he saw what I was going to write about. And, you know, when the, the proposal that they bought um, in the end, it was like, they didn't ask me to make it this long, but I had, you know, 25 pages of what I saw happening in the plot. And I had about 50 pages of my short stories with Kayla <laughs> to show them my writing. It was a very different writing style, but just to show them some of my writing. And um, David Levithan, who's my editor on both books, um, he saw that and he said, you know, I haven't seen this book on a shelf before and I'd love to help you get it there. So they were, they were fantastic. I mean, to the point also where, you know, I didn't want to italicize words of South Asian origin unless they sounded foreign to Dimple. Um, so thing, you know, he, he uncopy edited the copy editor and chuckles and chat, like all of these different words that Dimple understands, none of them are in ITAL. And part of that was, you know, I wanted to, you know, de other the otherness of, of those words, because those aren't other words for those of us who know them, right. And just as we've learned the meanings of various other types of language, just by reading stories and understanding context. I think you can you can go quite far with that too. So he was also cool with not including a glossary. I didn't want a glossary in there either because I thought that's how you learn what words mean though, as you read stories and you kind of see how things make sense together. So you know, he was amazing, Scholastic was amazing. And what was a, a real gift is, it was sort of the opposite of pushback, like the the number of readers who wrote, you know, to talk about how it helped helped them or they felt sort of supported in their journeys as Indian Americans or South Asian Americans, but, uh, but as part of, you know, the queer community or, you know, coming out, that kind of thing. That's, that's been very moving and humbling and just beautiful to, to witness, you know, because a story goes out there and it's not really, it, it's ours. It's not really any one person's anymore. It's, it's more kind of a device to just help humans connect. I mean, you're doing the work that we are doing now, you, but you did it way year, so many years ago. It's crazy. You know, we started recently being able to openly talk about things like that, but you've made that connection from so long ago. And like what Annika was saying, I feel like the conversation came to be, then the conversation died, and now it came to be again. Yeah. Well, thank you for continuing the conversation. We, are, we ain't done yet. <laughs> yeah, we're not done. No, no, no. It's, you know, it's just so amazing though, honestly, at the end of like, it's, it's pretty astounding when you think back and you, you know, because it was such a pivotal thing and I, and I realize I'm kind of waxing poetic about the same thing over and over, but it was such a unique experience to be able to see myself in a book. And then I can easily say that as someone who wasn't ex exposed to the LGBTQ community, as far as I know, back then, um, and definitely not within our South, in South Asian community at home, for sure. It wasn't a conversation that we ever had at home. Reading that and reading these adorable cousins and hating and loving certain characters and finding so much beauty and getting so wrapped up in the humanity of the story itself was incredibly profound just in terms of shaping how I saw all of these issues going forward. So once I got to college, I remember meeting someone who wasn't straight and, and it, it was like, oh, okay, cool. And I remember that because it was shaped by seeing that in a book. 
and seeing that in your book. And those certain moments have kind of snowballed into so much more acceptance and so much more humanity, which is both the power of the literary word and how writers can shape their readers' opinions in so many different ways, but it's also a testament to what you brought to the South Asian community as a whole, because if it's happening to me, I'm sure it happened to tens of thousands of other girls and other boys who are reading these books and recognizing themselves in it and going, oh, wow, we really never talked about these things in my house. Here, how am I actually going to approach this when I'm challenged with it later or when I'm like kind of facing it later? What am I going to do? Also, the other thing with Harsh that really threw me, and I remember this distinctly at 16, is that I only liked white boys through college. It was a thing because I just didn't grow up with enough brown boys to really even have like an interest. I didn't recognize myself as brown for a long time because all I had was a home, right? So it's like you said, you kind of write yourself out of the narrative. And you begin to take on the narrative of everybody around you, which is white. So I didn't even like Indian boys. And I remember, gosh, was the game changer. Because I was like, listen, I need a DJ. I need a DJ in New York for this to work. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and this is what's going to happen when I go to New York City. And then I'm going to find a really great Indian boy who's totally going to break all the rules and be like quietly a badass and also perfect for my family. Um, so I think I think the bar was set quite high um, in terms of both his suitability and unsuitability and just rebellious enough for a teenager to love and just perfect enough for a family to love. So. <laughs> Something I'm actually super curious about is your first book came out in 2002 and then 12 years later, Bombay Blues came out, which is the sequel. And it's kind of this coming of age story and the story of Dimple continues. So how did your readers react to that? I mean, they waited 12 years for another book. Did you still have them with you? Were they also growing along with your story and there was more of like maturing on their end and maturing on your end? How did that all happen? And what made you want to continue the story of Dimple? So in terms of what made me want to continue the story of Dimple, in the decade between books, I became a mother to two daughters, which was part of the reason for that long gestation. And um, though I did explore a few other book ideas during that time, in the end, I suppose I just missed Dimple Lala too much. And, and becoming a mother made me kind of feel maternal towards her in a different way. And I was wondering, you know, where she was, who she was hanging out with, what she was up to. And I knew the only way to, um, to answer those questions would be to, you know, to write the answers to those questions, to write that story. And it became compellingly clear that Bombay was where I was going to be able to find Dimple at that point in my life. And um, I think that's also because becoming a parent myself also crystallized my desire to know more about the literal motherland of my, of my mother, of my parents. Uh, Bombay is the city where um, my parents met in medical school. My mother was born and raised there. Um, my parents married there. My brother was born there as well. And, you know, I'm, I'm the only American born in our family. And I had lived in Bombay just as a baby for a little bit of time, but I barely knew the city. So, you know, I really longed to kind of forge my own connection with, with the city. I mean, to have to, a, a different kind of connection with family history, but also to have, you know, to find my own in to, um, to Bombay. And um, in the book, in Bombay Blues, uh, Dimple follows sort of a similar path. And she heads to Bombay for a wedding, that of her cousin, Sangeetha. And the trip ends up being far more about the unplanned and the unanticipated and the unmapped. And that was all paralleled by my you know, research process for this novel. I took three research trips there. And it was a very different, um, different process than um, writing Born Confused because with Born Confused, I was writing about a city I had lived in for nearly a decade and sort of looking back on, on experiences, you know, it's fictionalized, but I had lived a lot of those moments like the, you know, the Bhangra scene and the South Asian club scene and, and academic scene and all of that. And with Bombay, um, you know, I couldn't really look back to my baby memories to sort of inform Dimple. So it was really about kind of trying to find a way to, to you know, shape her story there while also trying to figure out the city and not do it a disservice with my lack of knowledge. Um, so Dimple's photographic plan while in Bombay is to photograph the browns of the city. So the browns of skin tone, of landscape, of you know sand on the beach, rust on the buildings. And that's what I thought was going to be her plan there. Um, but the more time I spent in Bombay during these research trips um, and with my characters, to my surprise and to my delight, the color blue began to overwhelm. The blue skins of the gods and goddesses, um, the Mount Mary of Bandra, the blue bellies of fishing boats, and the blue tarp rooftops. 
And so like Dimple with her photography, my unmapping map, if you will, while writing this book became um, to follow a color all the way through and just kind of try to see where it would lead to. And, um, and in loosening the coordinates in that way, another theme sort of emerged while I was writing the book, um, the idea that there's no place like home because home is not a place. It's a sense of sanctuary, which you might find in a person, a moment, a memory. And it's, it's sort of more of a direction and a refuge. And so that was, that was my process. And then in terms of readers, this has been really interesting too. There've been sort of three camps of readers. There's one is like the new teen reader of um, Dimble's story. So Scholastic re-released Born Confused a few months before Bombay Blues launched. And um, so there, there was sort of a group of readers that were teen readers kind of in um, Scholastic's, you know, uh, a big part of their demographic, their readership. And if they read the books back to back, I think some of these readers were expecting a different outcome in Bombay Blues. And I won't throw in any spoilers, but you know <laughs> what I'm talking you about. You know. <laughs> yeah. And uh, it, it makes sense because in, if you do read the books back to back, especially at that point in your life, you know, no time has really gone by for the reader but two and a half years have gone by for dimple and 10 had gone by for me so i'm not saying that that outcome that was expected is never happening as there's still more to be you know more of the story to be told in the series but it just wasn't going to happen so quickly like it didn't it didn't feel right for you know to me for that to happen for the characters so quickly so some were surprised by the path or paths she took in Bombay Blues, but this was part of the point of the book because that theme of dropping the map and seeing where life leads you was part of the point of that, of her story and her journey there. Then there's a second camp of older readers um, who grew up in real time with the story and having lived a little longer, saw more of their lives reflected in this um, not so straightforward path in terms of love and friendship and your relationships with your family and work and career and following your passions as life is rarely that straightforward as we, as we discover. <laughs> we discover very quickly sometimes, but, or we discover and rediscover it as we, as we go along. Um, what was great either way though, was kind of the strong feelings. So seeing how much Dimple met, Dimple and her behavior and, you know, her life choices meant to these various readers, you know, that, you know, what would make some of them say, I can't believe she would do that. And others sort of say, Oh, this makes sense for her, for her path. That was, that was moving for me. Um, and then there was an, another kind of group of readers who read Bombay Blues as a standalone book. Um, and that was really cool and interesting too, as they came to the characters with no um, expectations or information about them, which allowed a different kind of relationship, I think. All of which goes to prove or show that, you know, books, once they're out in the world, are really a collaboration between the writer and the reader. I mean, it's really sort of teamwork and it's all about that dynamic. Um, Something else that was interesting in India, so Bombay Blues and, and the re-release of Born Confused and um, the album I did for Bombay Blues, they launched in India at the um, Jaipur Literature Festival. And then there was a, a, some events in Bombay, like a book album party in Bombay and some you know, school talks and all. A lot of the conversation around Bombay Blues in India was about globalization and the reverse diaspora, what it means to be American, what it means to be Indian, um, in this kind of context where identity isn't so definable by geography. Whereas in the US, though some of this comes up, the conversations here were usually more about YA literature in the context of YA literature. We need diverse books, diverse voices, and writing about people of color and so forth. And um, of course, India is an incredibly diverse country in terms of everything. <laughs> so religion, language, region, caste, and South Asia, even, you know, an even more diverse area and identity. So whereas in the US, diversity vis-a-vis -vis the books would maybe be discussed in terms of, you know, brown and white, like brown people of color in a predominantly white world. In India, the conversations could kind of go to the level of Gujarati, Maharashtran, Punjabi, Sikh, like a different kind of level of detail, because there was sort of some base information that was the same across the board, and then we could kind of delve in that way. Um, so all kind of different, which is really interesting because it's the same words on the page. So, um, so that was, that's been an interesting experience to see like where you are, where you are in your life, as well as where you are geographically, how much that informs the um, reading journey. It's something that, that has been wonderful throughout the process 
you know, no matter how we name our identities, have been, you know, letters from, well, now they're emails. When the, when the first book came out, they were letters from readers, sometimes emails, and now, of course, it's all emails or, you know, Facebook Messenger and all. But what's been, what's been um, kind of lovely is that many of these letters express the same message they did back in 2002 when Born Confused first came out, and that message sort of being like, you know, that's my family. The food might be different. The food's a little bit different. The music they're playing is different, but that's, you know, that's what goes on in my family too, or that's what happened with my friend when I was growing up. And that's really heartening because I think ultimately we write and we read to connect and to feel we're not alone. And so messages like that just, it feels, that just feels really good because you feel like you're in a community and in a family of kindred spirits. You may never meet them, but you meet on the page. And then from the page, you sort of leap into the imagination. So that's been, that's been really lovely. That's really interesting, actually, just to see how it's taken across different places and like how people relate it to their own experiences as people of color, whether they're surrounded by them or whether they're not. And, you know, how they feel included or excluded or what parts they relate to. Just once again, the humanity of it is, is fascinating. I think that's a really interesting kind of take on all of it by all of your readers and also I can relate to to the reactions as well because I was one of the ones who grew up uh, reading it and then taking that break and then reading it when it came out again with Bombay Blues and relating to it in the sense of growth in the sense of different things happening in the book that you go oh yeah that's so much more like life and you know this is you know without giving too much away just so much more like man that makes so much sense you know and and sometimes things happen that don't, aren't expected and, and Pat, life takes so many different crisscrossing paths that you never see coming. Um, but going to that life being kind of crisscrossy, one of the things that you had mentioned on your blog, and it made me think about it over and over after I read it, was the concept of reinvention. And you said that you be believe that reincarnation happens within this lifetime all at once, simultaneously in different rhythms. It's just sort of this constant evolution of people. And your story behind Bombay Spleen, the album created from layers of you and in conjunction sort of with writing of Bombay Blues, was led you kind of to the lesson that you should drop the map and allow things to be. Is that still kind of a creative mantra or are you sort of discovering other ones as you continue forward on your journey? At this moment in time with everything that's going on, I would like a map and I would like it to be a certain kind of map. <laughs> you know, it's interesting you're saying that. That was definitely like a guiding, you know, principle while writing Bombay Blues. And part of that is simply because, you know, one cannot plan, you know, it took me like two days of being in Bombay to research. I thought I was going to research Bombay Blues in like one research trip and then come back and write the book. And I had to think that or I would have never gone because I had, you know, like a, a one year old, one in four months and a six year old at that time. And it was so complicated to travel. But of course, like day two in Bombay, the entire plan goes out the window. I'm stuck in traffic for three hours. You know, I had kind of like created this whole schedule where I was going to do this, this, and this, and like, you know, go on a shoot with this photographer and like go check out this temple. And I had like planned this whole sort of schedule and nothing went to plan at all. And, <laughs> and then uh, I remember like on day two when I was planning to like meet, I don't know, 10 photographers and artists for a dinner to interview everybody and then go back and, you know, go back home and write about everything. I was sitting stuck in traffic and I called Bernard, my husband, um, back in London. And I said, you know, like, I can't even get to the meeting that I set up because of Bombay traffic. And I said, I'm, I'm just never going to have my Bombay experience at this rate. I was feeling really discouraged. And he said, you are having it right now. So just <laughs> sit back and realize that this is, this is actually the Bombay experience. And so the character literally drop loses her map in the book. And that was paralleled by, by my just throwing my outline out the window. And since this, these recent years and times and the pandemic and everything that's going on, you know, I, that book, I really wanted it to be about, you know, going with the flow, going into spaces that you think you weren't going to go into before. And, and um, just like, you know, being ready to surrender to the surprises life throws your way. Now, I just feel like in the third book, I just want to give her her happy ending or happy beginning, have it all like very clear, nothing ambiguous, like, you know, and I think it's, it's that feeling that that need that I think all of us are having at the moment of 
tiring keeping your shoulders up near your ears all the time and being kind of constantly tensed with what the world's been throwing our way, you know. Finally and, uh, gave the readers a formula and a, yes. like a neat way to kind of figure it out. Don't make them use any additional brain power to figure out yes. what's going to happen. <laughs> Just like make it, it all them. good and fluffy and cuddly and happy and warm and, and cozy. Keep it, keep it nice so that yeah. everybody yeah, yeah. can just find some bright spots in the years to come like yes. after this year because it's going to take so long for everybody oh my to gosh. recover. So, I mean, we'll see, we'll see what happens in that one. But I think that, yeah, in terms of like reincarnation being something that happens within this lifetime, when I was writing the scene where Dimple photographs Zara, um, you know, kind of shifting her identity, um, I, I started thinking about that and just the idea that, you know, even for Dimple, she is a character who initially hides behind her camera, feeling like she's spying into a world that she can't really be a part of. And you know, through her journey, she starts to realize that there's no such thing as being a passive onlooker and in deciding the frame and the angle and who's going to get to, you know, have the light shown on them, like who's going to get the center of the center of the picture, you know, she's been actually shaping her own story and her identity. And um, I think that that that's sort of something maybe to keep in mind too, not, not ex exactly, I don't know if it's a mantra or not a mantra, but just this idea that, you know, we actually have that power to make change and to keep ourselves in the center of the story and to bring the margins to the page. And during this time as well, where things can feel very difficult, sometimes hopeless, you know, there is hope in that, in kind of putting faith in the power of our stories and the sharing of them, because stories teach us empathy and they teach us how to, connect and they teach us how to walk in another set of shoes and and uh i think that that's always a good thing to learn more about and be able to do and especially now when there's so many in so many ways people feel divided and you know like actually just even being being separated and divided by the pandemic and not being able to see loved ones and you know not being able to travel so freely and all i think that that uh stories can really help keep us keep us connected and and really kind of move everything forward towards positive change. Empathic, inclusive, intersectional, you know, generous. Yeah, I completely agree. I think a lot of people have just learned a lot about themselves and each other during this pandemic. And it kind of makes you more open-minded about everything that's happening. And you kind of take everything with like a grain of salt moving forward now. But aside from you being this author, musician, amazing writer, who is, who are you as a human? I know you're a mom, but what else are you? And a great wife, but what else is to peel back of all these layers? Oh, you're, you're very kind with all of the ways you're describing these layers. I, I find them all completely, everything is very inseparable to me because being a, you know, being a parent very much informed the second book. It didn't necessarily inform the first book because I was not yet a parent. Um, all of those different roles that we play in life, it feels like all of it is, all of it is very kind of intertwined and connected. Um, so yeah, so I have, so something that happened recently, which is a, a big, wonderful change that's happened in our lives is we'd moved back to the States and we just at the end of March moved my parents in to live with us in Maine. So my husband and daughters and I moved back because it was getting harder for them to travel. They're in their eighties now. And sadly, we lost our French parents, my husband's parents in, in recent years, actually while I was writing Bombay Blues. Um, that was a long, pro it was a four year process and we lost both of them during those, those years. Um, it would have been more difficult to leave if we were also leaving them in France to come back to the States, but it became very clear that, you know, now we need to come back and be, be in the same place. And we went initially to Western Massachusetts to Wilbraham where my parents were still living. And then my brother who has been in Maine for more than 20 years, you know, said, why don't you guys come check out Maine for a little bit while you're figuring out what you're going to do. And we came to Maine in 2018 and everybody loved it. I've never lived near the ocean, like to the point where I can in five minutes, you know, see the water. So that's been just a very exciting thing. Sometimes we, we just say like, let's just go look at it because we can. <laughs> <laughs> it's just right there and um, and our daughters love it it's it's a whole other kind of way of existence they loved london when they lived in london but this is such a different experience for them i grew up in a small town in western mass and you know we had woods and fields and meadows not so much now it's been a little bit overbuilt but you know i my childhood was spent like crossing you know log bridges over streams and things like that and now they're getting that which is something they didn't have so much of in london 
And um, so they're very happy. And then my parents, you know, then they realized like we were happy here and we came back to be with them. So they moved after years and years and years in Wilbraham. We moved them in with us at the end of, um, of March. And that was part of the plan pre pandemic, but it ended up being, you know, 10 times the blessing, a hundred times the blessing in the situation we ended up moving in because we had no idea, you know, that was, that was kind of our timetable and it just so happened. It was like two weeks after schools closed and everything. So we are all quarantined together here in Southern Maine. And it's just been, you know, lovely that we are blessed enough to be able to do that. We're five minutes away from my brother and we have at least one meal a day where everybody's at the table together and, you know, the grandkids are getting to hear the grandparents' perspective. Like we'll be talking about politics or talking about art or a book or a movie. And it's just wonderful having all of those perspectives and all of that love around one table. And we can hug and we can, because we've been quarantined together. So, you know, there's no dearth of like physical affection and cuddling and snuggling up and, and, and all of that. So that just feels extremely, extremely lucky. My brother uh, recently, he's a neurosurgeon and he recently brought over like an operating gown and scrubs and all and, and created a very safe way for my nephews and my nieces to be able to hug the grandparents and for him too, in a safe way. And it was a whole kind of, it, it just looked like this very strange ritual like if you had seen if you had seen a glimpse of this even you know like eight months ago it would have just looked like what world are we in (laughs) we were kind of laughing and joking about it he came out to like the back of our house on the back deck and had the gown everybody was gelled you know nobody who touched the inside of the gown touched the outside and you know vice versa everything was done very very carefully and we were all laughing and joking about it and then when the first hug happened I think the first hug was with my so one of my, uh, my oldest niece is, li- has moved to New York. She graduated from college. My older nephew just started college and moved to Vermont. And my younger one is still in, in high school. But I think it was my nephew maybe who did the first hug with the grandparents. It was so moving. We, everybody cried. And we went from laughing and joking about the space suits and ha ha, you know, this is how we hug now and you know that kind of thing. And then there was just complete silence and, the hugs were so long and so epic and so beautiful. And, you know, these are teenage boys. They didn't wriggle away. Yeah. <laughs> kind of like. Didn't my, shoot in the opposite direction. Like, why are yeah. you doing this to me? <laughs> yeah. No, it was, just, it was just long and luxurious and beautiful. Everybody was teary eyed. And, um, and yeah, it was just, it was amazing. We were able to do that, that we're all close enough physically that we can do that. And it also just really makes you realize what we're missing too. I mean, you know, just with, with just human touch and contact and, and being able to kind of relax into that, relax into your love instead of having to like hold up, you know, so much protective gear to protect what you love, which we're all doing as well. Yeah, it really makes a difference. And I think it's beautiful that you guys have been able to spend that time together during such a, such a wild time. I mean, you know, people are having babies, you know, people obviously, you know, are going through these huge monumental moments in life and without their loved ones there. So there is some blessing, but also just beauty to be had in, in these last six to eight months of being around your parents during such a valuable time with them as well. So I'm so happy that you've gotten that chance. Thank you. And I'm hoping all of you, yours, family and friends and everybody's doing well and is safe. And Thanks. Yeah, everybody's doing, doing pretty good so far. I think, you know, the, the wedding definitely got downsized a lot, but everything else has been, um, yeah, <laughs> but it's been good. I've been, I've been feeling so loved and so lucky and, um, you know, everyone's, everyone's doing well. And I know the same is pretty much with Nahal as well. So it's been, it's been really good. Yeah. Thanuja. Of all the guests that we've had, this has probably been the most life-changing experience because of the influence that you had on my own adolescence and now adulthood. So I cannot thank you enough for coming on the podcast with us and having a chat. For listeners, right now, the week of this episode's release, we are running a giveaway from Sunday to Friday, and it'll be a personalized copy of Thanuja's books, Born Confused and Bombay Blues. Follow her at Thanuja Desai EDA on Instagram and follow us at the woke Daisy on all social media platforms. As we always say, get woke, stay woke. Blackout across the bay. Se puede pretty
party people stay Praying for the ship to come in Bottoms up, to sun up, but lands in Eye to the telescope Marauders all around me grow Yet my lover ain't allowed to dive in Anti-party pass a turn, you're in You're blue me Blue me All quiet on the eastern country Bolo how the west was one free Seven, seven, say we won't escape Let you win it then by all means no permit for a long stiff Duke, how a girl's supposed to Think, bar, bar, bleaching, bar, her skin Motherland, her